Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The death of any creature is a tragedy, from a beloved family member to the smallest insect. Even when nature takes its course and a lion devours a gazelle, it's still hard to watch such a loss of life, no matter how common it may be. For humans, that loss is commemorated in some kind of ritual burial. Some Tibetan Buddhists, for example, leave their dead outside for the birds and other animals to eat. It's an act known as a sky burial, and it's meant to acknowledge the circle of life as the body is returned to nature. In South Korea, many people have their deceased loved ones cremated and turned into beautiful beads in colors like blue-green, pink, and black. The beads are then stored and displayed in glass containers or dishes. It's a way to honor those who were lost in a colorful and uplifting way. In 1836, Scotland, however, a different kind of burial rite was discovered. To this day, no one knows exactly what it meant or who started it. All we know is that it took nimble fingers. During the summer of that year of 1863, several boys were climbing a hill known as Arthur's Seat. Now, Arthur's Seat was actually an ancient volcano that was part of a hill cluster east of the city. Climb to the top of Arthur's Seat today, and you can look out over the bubolic green pastures leading toward the modern buildings and homes of Edinburgh. But in 1836, there was more countryside to explore, and the boys were out hunting rabbits. During their escapade, they came to a cave, the entrance to which was blocked by several sheets of slate. It took some effort, but they were able to remove the obstruction and peer inside. They found 17 coffins arranged in three rows. The first two rows contained eight coffins each, while the third row only had one. The coffins were removed and opened. Inside were bodies in varying states of decay some wrapped in cloth, others dressed in handmade clothes. No one knew who placed them there, and even after news reports were published weeks after the discovery, nobody claimed responsibility. According to an article in The Scotsman on July 16th of 1836, it was believed that one person had been behind the coffin's presence in the cave and that they had been placed there over a number of years. The wood of the coffins in the first row had rotted away considerably. The last coffin, though, the one by itself in the third row, was much newer and couldn't have been older than a few days. But what really puzzled the locals was how small they were. These weren't children's coffins. They were described in the press as Lilliputian, measuring only 3.7 inches long. And the bodies inside were actually wooden figurines. In other words, dolls. Once word got out, rumors began to spread about what the coffins had been used for. The Scotsman reported that they had been created by witches as part of their spells. It wasn't completely unfounded, either. Arthur's seat had been a hotbed of witchy activity during the 16th century, complete with hasty accusations and even hastier burnings. Another theory was that the figures had been effigies of people who had died far from Edinburgh, a common practice in Saxony. Who had made and entombed them, however, remained a mystery. Despite the healthy amount of speculation as to the origins of the tiny coffins, the truth was nowhere to be found. Until another theory cropped up 150 years later. But during the 1800s, Edinburgh, like many parts of Europe, were plagued by a disgusting and disrespectful practice. Grave robbing. Medical students in need of corpses often utilized less-than-legal ways of obtaining bodies for study. And in 1827, two men found a great way to put some money in their pockets by helping students and teachers alike. Their names were William Burke and William Hare. Hare ran a boarding house where one of his guests died unexpectedly. He sold the body to a Dr. Robert Knox for seven pounds, ten shillings. Seeing a new business opportunity before them, Hare and Burke started selling the corpses of the people who died at the boarding house to Knox, who used them in his anatomy class. There was just one problem. Those guests weren't dying on their own. The two men had to help nature along. Over the course of 10 months, Burke and Hare were believed to have killed 16 lodgers, P. 
people who had been traveling alone with little or no family to miss them. They were finally caught in 1828 and prosecuted for their crimes. In the 1990s, Samuel Menifee of the University of Virginia and Alan Simpson of Edinburgh University proposed that these 17 coffins represented Burke and Hare's victims, the 16 they murdered, plus the first victim who had died of natural causes. Unfortunately, every theory has proven to be nothing more than that. A theory. There is no way to know for sure who made the dolls, their clothes, or the coffins in which they were placed. Today, only eight coffins survive and are on display at the National Museum Scotland. But the story doesn't end there. In 2014, the museum received a package. Inside was a tiny coffin with a wooden doll inside it, just like all the others. Included was a note with the number 18, written out in Roman numerals across the top. Below that, the words, To the National Museum of Scotland, a gift for caring for our nation's treasures, followed by a passage from Robert Louis Stevenson's short story, The Body Snatcher, which had been based on Burke and Hare's exploits. The museum had no clue who'd sent it, and there was no return address. From England's Buckingham Palace to Versailles in France, royal palaces were more than just living quarters for the country's rich and powerful. They hosted leaders in other countries, and they turned into hubs of government activity. Versailles, for example, became France's de facto capital after Louis XIV began conducting official business there. But one palace stood out above the rest. It was the epitome of sophistication and decadence for almost 700 years— and it's also served as the seat of Brussels government for just as long. And yet, most people today don't even know it existed. The Palace of Caudebert started life as a castle, built around the year 1100 by the Counts of Brussels and Leuven. It was constructed out of the Caudebert, meaning cold hill in Dutch. By putting the castle on the tallest hill in Brussels, there was less of a risk of flooding from nearby rivers, and it literally elevated the Counts above the rest of the city. Over time, territories changed, as did those who ruled over them. In 1183, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa created the Duchy of Brabant, and a great big wall was erected around Brussels. The Duke of Brabant then moved the seat of the court from nearby Leuven to Brussels, specifically to Caudebert Castle. Because it had been built as a castle instead of a palace, the structure was fortified and served as a defensive military stronghold. In 1356, Count Louis II of Flanders breached the city's protective walls and occupied Brussels, but his forces were pushed out and new walls were constructed after they left. A castle had served its purpose, but that wasn't the end of its usefulness. Since it was no longer needed for defense, it was slowly converted into a palatial home and entertainment venue for visiting dignitaries. The whole property was expanded over the next few hundred years and new additions were constructed. The main building grew in size, a gallery was installed to display various artworks and statues, and a massive banquet hall was built. Charles V, the Duke of Burgundy, had a Gothic chapel installed during the 16th century there as well. Powerful elites began to build their own homes nearby, just so they could be close to the action. Caudeber Palace was suddenly the new hot destination for princes and diplomats from all over France, Germany, and the Netherlands, in more ways than one. The palace was no stranger to disaster. For example, its roof was damaged badly by a fire in 1679. But on February 3rd of 1731, things got out of control. Archduchess Maria Elizabeth of Austria, sister to Emperor Charles VI, was living at Caudebert and had gone to bed for the night. For some reason, though, she never put out the candles in her room. A fire started that quickly engulfed the rest of the palace. Emergency workers were unable to get to the affected rooms in time, though, since they did not have the authority to enter the private apartments inside, and the high winter winds only helped spread the fire even more. It didn't take long for the palace to burn down. Much of the art was lost, as were important court documents. The Archduchess was saved thanks to the quick actions of one firefighter who decided to break protocol and rush inside to get her. Of all the structures on the property, 
Only the chapel and the banquet hall still stood once the flames had been put out. But when all was said and done, the fire was officially blamed on the kitchen staff instead of the Archduchess, due to the feared backlash of accusing her of such thoughtlessness. A public square was built atop the ruins in 1775, and if you didn't know any better, you'd think that it had been there forever. There were no remnants of the old palace left behind at street level. The chapel and the walls of the banquet hall were all torn down. But below the feet of those milling around the square, the palace wasn't truly gone. The buildings that occupy the space today, such as the Center for Fine Arts and the Musical Instruments Museum, sit directly on top of the stone passageways and brick walls of the original palace, which were excavated over 25 years starting in the 1980s. Brick walls dating back to the 15th century are still intact. The vaulted archways that once sat below the chapel are illuminated today by modern light bulbs instead of wax candles. Statues are encased in protective glass, and the crumbling remains of a staircase to nowhere can be seen behind a chain rope. Underneath this part of the city, there are great big rooms with cobblestone floors that take visitors back in time hundreds of years. There may even be more of the original palace that hasn't yet been found. But for now, visitors can still get a unique glimpse into Brussels' past. All they have to do is peel back the surface and look down. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious.